All right, welcome to another episode of the Wasabi Research Club. Today we are examining CoinJoin Sudoku, weak privacy guarantees for shared coin mixing service. Um, and we have the author with us today to talk about it. Um, it's not fair to call this uh, a paper as much as it is um, a weakness that was discovered in 2014 and then uh, published to alert the community about the concerns with a particular implementation of CoinJoin. We're joined uh, by Christoph Atlas, who will answer questions and correct anything that I've said uh, incorrectly about his, his work. Um, and he also happens to work for blockchain.com, which was blockchain.info, which is the uh, particular protocol in question that we are um, examining here. You can find all of the work uh, and all information on our uh, GitHub link just below. Just a reminder where we are, we did uh, four weeks of Coin Shuffle Plus Plus and Cash Fusion. Um, last week, we talked about principles in privacy, which was um, much more philosophical and less uh, math heavy. Um, this week is Kojo and Sudoku. And then, of course, as always, we decide on the paper for next week at the end of this call. You can find out everything on our GitHub, of course. Just a reminder of what we talked about last week. Uh, in, when we talked about prin uh, privacy principles, we discussed how uh, there are some common reoccurring things you shouldn't do when you are trying to build privacy tools in anonymity networks. Uh, and those things include, for example, insecure modes of operations on your software or optional security that someone might turn off and never turn back on or badly labeled off switches such that the person doesn't know that they're you know, uh, not using a very critical privacy feature. Um, it's important that the security is convenient because if it's incredibly inconvenient, everyone will sort of uh, sidestep the proper way of doing it. Um, uh, the false sense of security is, is, is really important to avoid and uh, ensuring that we have good mental models for how we think about privacy for the user such that they know when they're doing something correctly or incorrectly. And we had uh, an interesting discussion uh, against options, so minimizing the amount of options that uh, the privacy software allows for the user. Uh, we answered this fundamental question, or at least we tried to, how should we think about building or using privacy tools and anonymity networks? Uh, we, we discussed how a tool like Tor, which is an anonymity network, it depends on users that are entering and exiting the Tor network. Uh, and we're not entirely clear who is who, but there are obviously some problems with these anonymity networks. For example, if there are not enough users, in this case here, there's only one user, so it's clear that even though this user is routing through Tor, um, uh, the, uh, the output and input can be linked quite trivially. We talked about how common behavior can help us link inputs and outputs. Here we have uh, a lot of English speaking people, and then we have a Hungarian speaking person, and we can link the Hungarian inputs and outputs because they're a minority. Um, today we're talking about something different. We're talking about a flawed implementation of CoinJoin. Um, and it, it's fair to say that this paper, it would have been better had we read this paper before reading the 2017 Knapsack CoinJoin paper. We're going to find out that the Knapsack paper in 2017 uh, did a lot more work um, and likely built off of this work. So essentially we're... we're, we're we're examining a paper that has um, uh, that covered a lot less ground, um, and, and I think that's okay because it was it was a very early on in the Bitcoin privacy uh, timeline. So, what is shared coin? Shared coin is the coin join uh, implementation by Blockchain.info. Um, some basic things ab about shared coin coin joins is that they typically have more than nine inputs and more than nine outputs. Um, number of inputs and outputs were often different, and there was a constant minor fee of 0 0.0001 denomination. Uh, transactions were also always broadcast from the blockchain.info IP address. And just to, to hop in here to for a, a brief moment, 
Um, mm -hmm. Although the number of inputs and outputs was typically fairly high, um, since publishing that advisor, I did come across some transactions which were, um, you know, claimed to be shared coin transactions, difficult to verify uh, decisively, but some of them had fairly low in the ballpark of maybe even four inputs or outputs. So there are some, uh, certainly some exceptions to that rule for what it's worth. Yeah. And that's a very good, good thing to point out. Um, I think it's fair to say that apart from uh, the minor fee and the IP address of the broadcast, there wasn't anything uh, that clearly uh, outlined these transactions as being part of shared coin, apart from the fact that they have more than the normal number of inputs and outputs that we would expect. Um, uh, so this is called fingerprinting. So here we're fingerprinting a shared coin, uh, coin join. Um, and the, the idea of CoinJoin Sudoku, and again, this was back in 2014, um, is what we talked about with the Knapsack uh, paper, which is that we want to find groups, subsets of a transaction where input sums and output sums match. Um, and at, at this point, I think it makes a little bit of sense to just quickly remind ourselves what the Knapsack paper covered because in, in, in all honesty, again, the knapsack paper just did um, did a more thorough job of answering this question because again, it was written quite a bit later. Um, but the knapsack paper, uh, oh my goodness, I think I might be getting kicked out of the room. Pardon me one sec. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, I'm just going to need 10 seconds and we're going to get back to just mute yourself for a second, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes, so I, I've been wondering, and actually, a lot of people are wondering. The, you might have some insider information. Why was shared coin discontinued? Let me uh, ponder what I want to say about that. Um, so I think it's fair to say that um, um, as people started exploring these type of services, uh, there was increasingly concern from a legal standpoint as to how various governments about the world might treat such services and and um, how this would overall impact the regulatory attitude towards Bitcoin. Um, people were pretty uh, concerned about the idea that, um, you know, these kind of services gaining popularity would paint uh, cryptocurrency in a negative light at the time. So I think that is something that factored into it. Um, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, compared to the overall uh, volume in the Bitcoin network and, and certainly at blockchain.info at the time, it was a relatively small portion of, of, uh, of transactions that were using the service. So um, probably some combination of the two ultimately led to the decision not to continue the project. Mm, I see. Thank you. Uh I, I can see that was pretty much everyone's guess, but uh, there was no real confirmation about that, at least as far as I know. So what's up, Aviv? Are you back? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I just had to move rooms. Uh, everything's fine. We're going to continue as, as normal. Um, so uh, ShareCoin did what uh, the Napsack paper talked about, which was uh, combine transactions together because there's nothing in the protocol that... Uh, excludes one person's inputs and outputs from not being part of the same transaction as another individual's inputs and outputs. Um, and, um, you know, here we had an example that we looked at, I think, uh, two months ago, uh, where on the left you can see two unique transactions, and on the right you see them being merged. Um, and when we merge two transactions, if we want to um, investigate any input and output links, what we really want to do is figure out uh, matching sums on the inputs and outputs. So in this case, we would take a hypothetical output like this output number 50, and then take an input, 
maybe another input, and we try to see the sums on the left and the right, and in this case, they don't match. So we try again uh, with a different uh, set. And here you can see that the uh, inputs and outputs uh, perfectly match to break this transaction into two transactions. Just like that. Perfect. Uh, we talked about how good is the anonymity provided by this simple model and can we improve upon it? It turns out that in 2017, it was clear that this uh, uh, naive approach, which is the approach that shared coin took, uh, uh, didn't work. And we talked about that at length uh, during that call. Um, we're not going to go into all of the math stuff, but there is a nice definition that I liked from... Um, from that um, paper, which was uh, we can take any transaction and break it into subtransactions. Um, at a minimum, there's one subtransaction, which is the original transaction, but ideally you want to find more than that. And you want to uh, see how often inputs and outputs appear in the same subtransaction. And so the um, uh, the, uh, the paper has this uh, big thing here, but all this, this uh, fancy equation is saying is that you simply uh, take all possible combinations of a transaction, and, then, uh, 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 and that's on the bottom. And on the top, you uh, take only the, the uh, combinations where a particular input and a particular output were, were together. And what you get at the end is some sort of percentage or probability of how likely they are to be connected. And I thought this was very, uh, this is very appropriate and accurate in terms of being able to break down a, a, a transaction that, that is believed to be a coin join. Um, so in the paper, there was an, an example um, here of a shared coin transaction being broken down. And um, it's, it's, it's still a bit hard to see. And I think a few people mentioned this as well. Um, it wasn't entirely clear how uh, this breakdown was achieved. And I think that in light of the 2017 paper, we would not have agreed um, that this is how we would break down the transaction. Um, so the, 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 the red here actually makes a lot of sense because it is the, it, it's a perfect match, but it's also the case that, it's the only inputs and outputs that have five decimal places. Um, every other input and output has, has fewer than five decimal places. Um, now, over here, you know, it's, this might be a plausible way to uh, partition this transaction. However, it's unclear why we didn't partition this into five subtransactions within this transaction. For example, you see a 0 0.03 uh, BTC over here, and on the right, you see a 0 0.03. So who's to say that's not one individual that moved uh, money to themselves? Um, and you see that many, many times. So it's it's just unclear that these entire sets of transactions must point to each other. And then over here, again, we have this problem where there are mappings um, on the left side and the right side um, that were unclear. Uh, so, it, you know, it comes down to the fact that this was written kind of much, much before uh, uh, a lot of people were interested in sort of figuring these things out. Can, can we spend um, a bit of time on, on that? Oh, you're finishing already. Okay. Oh, yeah. Please, please uh, finish it and then come back here. <coughs> so I'll just wrap up and say that, um, you know, I, I looked at the, the, the GitHub and uh, s some of the work, and it does seem like... Um, uh, this paper was was later extended with other people's work. Um, uh, I, I'm curious about what Christoph has to say uh, today, but I, I, I do believe it was somewhat incomplete. Um, but anyways, yeah, uh, we can we can open it up to discussion. Okay, so let's talk about that first. Uh, so as far as I understood it, uh, you released this advisory. Uh, and shared the full advisory to blockchain info. And then 
you did not follow up with the code later on. Is that correct? Or I did not find something. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so there was a responsible disclosure period. Uh, once blockchain was on board with um, kind of publishing it, I put something out there and the graphic is just wrong, obviously. Uh, I put it I put it together a little hasty. I don't remember exactly what the mistake was that uh, caused that, that error. But um, yeah, and then I never got around to really correcting it. But, you know, I figured that the, the, the gist of it was expressed. As far as the code goes, um, I was never really very happy with the tool. And um, I did become aware of some other people working on uh, similar tools. Um, the main one that has um, really advanced um, since then is uh, now, uh, I guess the repository is under... Uh, uh, the uh, Samurai guys, uh, but uh, Boltzmann is a, a a transaction analysis tool that can do this kind of combinatoric subset sum knapsack problem uh, kind of analysis. Um, and so um, I just never bothered to really clean up the code and really get it out there because I figured that this other tool was was better. So that's the story as far as the source code goes. Mm, thank you. I, I was actually thinking maybe you actually had some heuristic assumptions that you could make the blue connections there. But, but okay, so that's not the case. Uh, but Aviv, uh, even that you, you, you put a tick there that, that the, the red is, is good, right? But even that's not, not correct because you, you might find a soft set there. And you might, and you find corresponding subsets from the remaining inputs and outputs, but that doesn't really matter because what really matters is that all the possible subset combinations. So if the red could even be, if you can create subsets with the outputs that some of the red coins are in, then you would have to do do your calculations there. You, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I only put a check mark saying that at least this sort of intuitively made sense. But you're you're entirely right. The, the red outputs also could be um, put into other subsets. So. so I so my point is, uh, Crystal, uh, until you find all the possible uh, subset combinations, you cannot really make a conclusive statement of any of the, the subsets. You could well, for that. the red ones. For the red ones, um, just looking at it briefly, it looks to me like we know that the red ones all go together. Um, they may, and then the same user, you know, the same key holder, let's say, may also own other inputs and outputs, including the possibility that all of them are owned by the same person. That's not actually how shared coin service ever worked. So that's not really a possibility. But uh, but as far as the subset, some issue goes, we know the red ones go together, but they could include um, other inputs and outputs for that particular key holder. Is that fair to say? I'm not sure about that. My, my I, point I think, is I think that that's, well, if you, so, so for example, one of the, one of the uh, efficiencies that I try to uh, gain in the system is it would start at the uh, least significant digit sort of at the end of the, the decimals, right? And start matching from there and kind of work its way up. And so um, you can see, uh, obviously, like uh, uh, Aviv mentioned, that um, there's not enough decimals in the um, the other categories to, to create decimals that far down in the number. So um, I, I won't try to do the math in my head, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Okay. 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 That's that's interesting. That's uh, actually, yeah. That that's another topic that I wanted to bring up. That let, let me read from the paper. Uh, where is it? <clears throat> For the sake of speed efficiency, the tool currently processes the transaction by examining one digit at a time in the inputs and outputs, working its way from the right to left. This is faster because transactions typically involve inputs and outputs with many zeros, 
which can be ignored by processing a given digit. Uh, it's actually, it, it, it may be even a new heuristic or, or one of the heuristic that Ethan Hellman was talking about when we were talking about naive coin joins. So it's uh, definitely an interesting that you can just speed it's, up. The- well, it's, it's, not a, it's not a matching heuristic, but it's a way of, of trying to speed up the process, uh, which I resorted to because the rest of my code was so horribly inefficient uh, as far as uh, computing the subset sums and stuff like that, that I uh, tried to incorporate that. And there were about bu- there is it was a bit buggy and you know so that's that's sort of why I never put the code out there. I didn't feel like trying to get it all resolved, but it was working well enough that you know we could say decisively we could grab a bunch of shared coin transactions, show that some of these definitely were matched up, um, and and put it put it out there that the service was not working in the way that you would see on the left. You know, if someone naive naively looking at the transaction on the left side of it might say, oh, that's a lot of inputs and I'm outputs. There must be a lot of privacy there. But in reality, that's not how it was working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and you did not have any other... So you, you didn't know how many users are in the transaction and you did not know how many inputs or outputs one user would create. So so these assumptions, you, you did not have any of that? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so if you if you look at the shared coin uh, source code, uh, the server side of the well, both the server side and the client side technically were published. Um, the uh, the shared coin server code has been yanked from GitHub, but I imagine that if you looked around a little bit, you could find it elsewhere. Um, but anyway, so you know the way the server end of the code works, which kind of coordinates these joins, there's all these parameters that you can set in, you know, a JSON file or something like that. And it will, so that will define things like, um, you know, the minimum and maximum number of users, um, minimum and maximum amount of amounts and so forth. So that there's various little parameters there. And those were uh, tweaked over time. Uh, some of those tweaks seem to have been published to the shared coin GitHub's server, but of course we don't know for sure um, whether uh, all of the changes that were implemented on the server, resulting on on ch- on chain joins, were actually you know put on 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 GitHub. Uh, and I don't have any insider information on that. Um, so so the way that the number of u- things like the number of users and some of the particulars about how these things are structured probably changed over time. And we can see some of that suggested in the commits to the server repo over time. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a really interesting point that, uh, that blockchain analysis, uh, really having a hard time of when, when some parameters and changing in some wallets and then when, when do users upgrade, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. for and, and if- hypothetically, um, someone could have downloaded the server code and run their own shared coin instance, right? And uh, they could have taken the client code and tweaked that or written their own client. So um, it's even possible that not all of these shared coin transactions, quote unquote, were run by blockchain.info at the time. It's possible that other people were doing it. I find that to be somewhat unlikely, or if it, if it did, I would expect it to be a very, very low volume of transactions on on chain, but it's hypothetically possible. Um, and um, I, you know, at the time, I think um, people who were thinking about running mixers, whether they were custodial or not, they were kind of thinking about this issue of deny, you know, plausible deni- deniability, and and you know, this idea like, well, who's to say that I was the guy who facilitated this this mixing transaction, right? So. I think that's one of the reasons why the source code was kind of published out there. Speculating on my part, but it seems reasonable to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so most of my larger questions, or, or yeah, most of my larger questions are answered already. So I, I have some some small one, but I, I leave others the opportunity. Uh, but but before that, uh, yeah, I just want to know that this this seems like huge amounts of him. Imp- huge number of inputs and outputs and I I still can't believe that you could 
right uh, efficient <laughs> algorithm to, to do that because I actually tried it myself. I, I was actually trying to do your your share coin coin join Sudoku, but but before that, when we were in the Napsack paper, that I, I wrote it and it was like six inputs, six outputs, and and maybe it was just my code so slow. And yeah, then, well, the, some of the some of the efficiency things that I mentioned around uh, decimal places and so forth definitely helped speed things up. Um, I did a lot of pre-calculation and, and uh, pre-generating tables that could be quickly looked up. Uh, but some, to be honest, some of the transactions, some of the larger transactions, uh, it would take days on my laptop to try and process them. I was too cheap to like you know buy some serious hardware to do it. Um, and some of them are just completely out of reach. Um, so yeah, so so as far as um, preventing uh, like mediocre computer scientists from analyzing these transactions, the sheer number of inputs and outputs worked pretty well. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't trust it against um, someone whose job it is to to do this kind of analysis. And you know, it's it's probably not not only your laptop. It's uh... You know, it's not even exponential. It, it is combinatorics, and combinatorics right. leaves exponential functions in in the mud that they are even faster. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. but, um, it, it might also be interesting to talk a little bit about like what we're seeing in this transaction. So uh, let me see if I can kind of zoom. It's a little fuzzy, but you know, in this this image uh, that Aviv has up from the advisory. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, for example, a bunch of inputs of 0 0.01 BTC, right? And um, it's kind of if you if you ever used shared coin back in the day when it was running, it would you would have to wait a few minutes for the whole process to work. And and uh, uh, well, let's just take a moment to like remember how it works. So it was web web, web wallet only. And one of the more interesting things about it was that it always did multiple rounds of joining. You never had just one round. Um, you had to have it, I think it was at least two, and maybe the maximum was five or something like that. So the longer that you, you the more rounds, and you there's like a little drop down that, where you could select how many rounds you're going to, to, to do, to commit to. And the, the longer, the more rounds that you picked, the longer it would take, obviously, and you would pay a bit more in you know, transaction fees as well. Um, and so um, one of my side projects right now, I'm trying to go back to ShareCoin and do some more uh, fingerprinting analysis. But one of the interesting things is to look at the inter-transaction fingerprinting as well, because there's, for all ShareCoin transactions, there was always a clear beginning, middle, and end to all of the, the, the these, these rounds. Um, so... Um, if you were a user back in the day, like it used to take a few minutes, generally speaking, for your web wallet to kind of wait around and find partners and so forth. And um, I can't remember exactly what gave me this idea, but I have a strong suspicion, again, no insider information here, but a strong suspicion that not all of the funds that were being mixed together came from users of blockchain.info at the time. I have a suspicion that the company at the time may have been um, including some funds as well. Um, whether that belonged to the company, there was some external source, I don't know. But so when we see these these re repetitive, uh, repetitive uh, amounts of like 0 0.01 BTC, for example, um, this is suggestive to me based on the other like, you know, kind of rumors that were circulating. I think it may have the, the guy, uh, Ben, um, uh, may have put this out there at some point in the past. Like, hey, we're, we're trying to make this service a little faster by trying to add some liquidity or whatever. But it, it certainly looks like um, something is being structured here in that um, maybe the service is injecting these inputs along with the user inputs. So the top two in red, right, they look like no effort has been done to prepare them for this round of shared coin. Um, and then some of them are much more rounded amounts. And so I think it's fair to speculate that um, maybe some of these rounded amounts came from, from the company or from the service, however you want to put it. 
And so um, I strongly suspect that if someone really sat down and looked at this carefully, they could really, really pull these transactions apart because they would be able to isolate inputs coming from the servers, service versus the users. And there might only be one, two, three users in this join outside of funds that were coming from a, a you know, let's say a custodial hot wallet that was contributing liquidity. Uh, and if I had gone further with this, you know, research, I think that's what I would have started to find is that uh, we could really pull apart the users from the service funds and then um, we would find not that many users per join. I, it's interesting. I, it never occurred to me. I actually use ShareCoin uh, quite a, a lot, like, <laughs> I don't know, 10 times, something like that. But yeah, it, it, it was almost felt somewhat instant. Uh, I don't know. You you can you can say that blockchain info had that volume, but yeah, if you looked at the the blockchain and and you found that that it's it's there there is a big big veil there. Although I mean, even if injecting volume here is not that much of an issue from privacy wise, because the, the, this you are under the assumption that the server knows the links anyway, so. It's like if the server participates in the joins, then more power to you, you know? Uh, that's, that's well, it would, it would only be a problem if you could uh, you know, fingerprint characterize the, the funds coming from the server and separate the, those out from the users. Um, you know, and if the server was not adding its funds in such a way that actually made the subset some problem harder, then you know, then it might just be completely useless for, for the server to add its own funds. And it, you know, it would have the kind of privacy effect that is the worst case scenario where you convince the users that they have all this privacy, but it does nothing to actually deter the attackers in the future. Um, you know, and since the blockchain is an indelible piece of forensic evidence that just gets easier to analyze over time, that's kind of a it's kind of a big deal, in my opinion. Makes, makes sense. Uh, all right. So, guys, what do you have? Let me organize my notes. Start talking. <laughs> Christoph, uh, you're part of the Bitcoin Privacy Initiative as well as blockchain. Can you tell me about what you do in both of those uh, roles just a bit more? Yeah, sure. So, um uh, the, the two are completely separate. Uh, the Bitcoin Open Privacy Project was something that we started back in maybe 2014, 2015. And um, it really, it's me and you know a handful full of other folks who I was in touch with. And we were interested in um, you know, promoting Bitcoin privacy um, and um, coming up with some standards, you know, so one of the products that we have, for example, we call like the top threats to, to Bitcoin privacy, and it's modeled after the uh, the OWASP top 10 for, for web applications. And, you know, it's this very famous uh, application security reference guide um, that gets updated here and there. So that's that was sort of the idea that we had for the organization was a kind of open source uh, you know, nonprofit kind of organization to 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 look at privacy and to try and promote it um, through shaming where where necessary. Um, and the shaming element came in the form of um, occasionally putting out some reports where we try to come up with some semi-objective criteria for privacy in different wallets and really try to highlight some of the the deficits that were that were out there to make it clear to people, you know, what they're giving up and, and um, help them make a little bit better decisions as far as consumers uh, kind of go. Um, now, entirely separate from that, I have also been working as a security engineer for blockchain.com. Uh, I joined somewhere in uh, late 2014. So it was uh, a bit after this research was, uh, when it, it was after I had been working on this research and published the advisory um, so, um, and you know, the, the, I didn't necessarily come on board, uh, specifically because of this advisory, but, uh, it, 
I was doing various things in Bitcoin and privacy and security. And so that's when I started working there as a security engineer. Okay, uh, that's awesome. So um, how uh, do you feel that blockchain wallet is um, is aligned to your privacy uh, principles that you, you hold? Uh, how does that uh, square? Yeah, great question. Um, so when the Open Bitcoin Privacy Project looked at wallets in the past, uh, overall, the blockchain wallets, and this it's been a few years since we've really updated that, mostly because there haven't been really exciting uh, improvements to to uh, to to observe in in Bitcoin privacy. But um, back when we f- polished our last report, blockchain wallet didn't really stand out in the pack among uh, competitors. Um, I think that. As a company, the privacy of users, you know, it's it's important to them. Um, but, um, you know, again, from a potentially legal perspective and just looking at the, the demand from users, there's not that many users who are really, really excited, passionate about uh, privacy-focused software in Bitcoin yet. I hope that's something that will change in the future but I don't think there's a huge market for that yet. And so the, I think the lack of demand and some of the other concerns around these technologies have made it such that, you know, blockchain.com has not been trying to push the forefront of this stuff necessarily as it did previously. You know, I think shared coin was an earnest attempt to really, um, they were, they were one of the first coin join uh, pieces of software out there came out pretty soon. Like this is clearly something that Ben was passionate about and started working on very soon after CoinGen was announced as an idea. And um, I think that just the demand and, and stuff hasn't really uh, made it a priority for the company overall. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that my relationship with the company is primarily motivated by you know privacy related stuff. Just, just a quick, quick note here that uh, from the paper, in a sample of 20,000 consecutive transactions across 45 blocks in the blockchain, 2.6% of the transactions fit the profile of shared coin transactions. This small sample constitutes only of seven hours of Bitcoin transactions from March 27, 2014. 2.6 percent, and and I think you identify these transactions like almost, probably yeah, uh, almost 100 percent certainty. Like it comes from blockchain info, that's for sure, and it has a bunch of inputs and bunch of outputs, which is very rare that that kind of thing is happening, or or like never. So. Yeah, uh, there there may have been some false positives with uh, like mining pools and um, mining pool payouts and uh, gambling transaction payouts and stuff like that. Um, that you know either we're using uh, blockchain dot com uh, blockchain info at the time uh, API to kind of broadcast the transactions, or you know sometimes it was just uh, happenstance that it happened to kind of get early on broadcasted uh, through blockchain and uh, uh, characterized that way. So there's there's some false positives in there very likely, but um, just to, to give a rough estimate, I would say probably easily at least 90% of those transactions, that would be a, a, an accurate characterization. Yeah. That- now, you might be tempted to say, well, 2.6% of transactions, that seems like a lot of volume, but keep in mind that the volume at that time was a good deal lower than uh, what we've experienced since then on the Bitcoin blockchain. So, um, you know, all that might, that might seem like a lot of users. Um, it's it's actually not a huge amount. Mm, yeah, makes makes sense. <laughs> all, although it is a huge amount because. Whenever I, whenever you sent a shared coin transaction, there was a bunch of people to join with you, uh, in that half an hour. And I'm, I don't know if we could even do that with Wasabi. I, I'm, 
I think we couldn't. So that's that, that's a that's a that's a very decent amount, so to say. Also, one more note sure. that shared coin had a very compared to shared coin, all the privacy tech on later coming on to Bitcoin is kind of like a UX step back <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> that's that's an interesting thought. Yeah, uh, shared coin may have been, it may still ha be out of all of the possible clients that have implemented coin joint technology, it may have been the most popular by number of users or volume, which is sad to say because it's quite ancient now, but uh, that's that's certainly possible. Anyway, uh, what do you guys have? What do you guys want to talk about? I can ask questions indefinitely. If anyone else wants to ask, please cut me off. Okay. Um, Christoph, uh, one thing that's a bit confusing is the sort of um, lack of consensus about the legal status of something like a coin join. Uh, at Wasabi, we're pretty convinced and we have a, a good legal team uh, that, that, that thinks about this. We're pretty convinced that CoinJoin isn't uh, violating any laws and that it couldn't uh, be considered to violate any laws. Um, I'm just curious as to why you think there is this clarity. Um, you know, it's a completely non-custodial thing, which means you're talking about privacy software interacting with other privacy software, doing what the protocol allows it to do. Um, you know, arguably the Lightning Network is is more custodial and has similar privacy features and participants helping others achieve that privacy. So wh why, why are we seeing all this confusion? Well, I'm certainly no lawyer, but I have talked to um, lawyers very active in this space. And I think um, it's a little naive, and I've made this what I'll characterize as a mistake before, is that it's a little naive to think about in terms of like, well, what in this particular snapshot in time is legal versus not legal? You know, there's a lot of different jurisdictions out there. Laws can change over time. And I think... Um, people who are high up in the, the Bitcoin ecosystem who are doing things like interacting, interfacing directly with regulators at, you know, major conferences and stuff like that. They don't just think about, you know, what's what's going to sort of the legal opinion right now, but what's the general attitude towards regulators, towards the, the industry as a whole. And um, that, that falls almost more under the heading of politics. Uh, and I think this is... This is something that maybe people don't have a lot of insight into because it doesn't get discussed publicly. Is there are people out there who are um, who are lawyers, but they are having conversations with regulators and um, um, uh, horse trading, you know, uh, as far as what kinds of features can can be gotten away with and what's what's going to um, darken the attitude of regulators towards cryptocurrency. If you think about the natural geopolitical tensions between cryptocurrency and um, regulators, politicians, uh, governments as a whole, it's kind of miraculous that there hasn't been more of a crackdown than, than there already has, right? And I think part of the explanation for that is um, um, that people in these kinds of backroom situations have been uh, conservative and careful about making decisions in that space. So if there's some, if there's some big company, I don't want to, I, I don't want to pick on blockchain in particular, but pick any large company in the space that has, you know, a lot of users has a lot of volume on blockchains has a lot of um, assets under management and, and, you know, a lot of funding and a lot to lose by being shut down. Right. Um, that, that is very different. You, you, that's a very different place to be in than say, um, you know, a relatively small project. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, you know, kind of privacy, Bitcoin privacy wallets out 
there would probably fall out more under that heading than the mega companies that are out there. And uh, it's just a, it's a different experience. Does that answer your question? That, that's, yeah, that, that's a very good response. I, I definitely uh, didn't think about it in that light because it, it would seem uh, incredibly uh, hard to believe that s some company is forced to shut down because of CoinJoin, but I, I appreciate that they might be shut down for other reasons where CoinJoin played a role in the decision and the uh, and, and swayed people uh, to that. So um, yeah, the the shutdown thing is like yeah, obviously that's the worst. That's the worst case. The worst case scenario is like all of your executives get arrested and sent to jail, right? And they get shut down and funds are seized and stuff like that. There's so many negative things that can happen, and there's so much backroom stuff that can happen in the interface between companies and regulators that um, you don't, I think it's, it's not that helpful to think it in that, that kind of binary way. Like, do I want to put this feature out there or will I get shit down? Right. And it's, it's, it's a lot more nuanced by that. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who, um, you know, they, they see these regulators as these kind of like sharks swimming through the ocean and they say, oh, well, you know, he hasn't eaten this guy and that guy, and he hasn't eaten me. Look, look at all the risks that I'm taking. The shark hasn't eaten me. It's just like, yeah, because you're, you're a little sardine, right? He's, you're not even like a snack for him. Um, so it's, it's, it's surprisingly complicated. I, I, I was not privy to a lot of that sort of before kind of getting more involved in the industry. All right. I think my last question is insignificant, so I'm not going to ask. Uh, so questions, three, two, one. What do you guys have? Do you have something or should we should we wrap it up? I have no questions. It's pretty clear to me. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to ask my last question. So in the paper, you talked about Bitcoin SX. Uh, as one of the first clients to implement CoinJoin. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah. What What was that? What was the story behind that? Do you know? Um, if I recall correctly, Bitcoin SX was like, um, it was a pretty simple, simple little GUI client um, that, that did this kind of coin join stuff. It was very naive. It was very restrictive about what kind of, uh, transactions, what, what kind of inputs could be involved, uh, that were allowed, um, probably had like an IRC backend or something like that. Uh, it was really something that some, someone scraped together. I also remember that shortly after it was announced, there were like, a um, aware, uh, fakes uh going around on reddit and so forth so people were really you know pissed off about having coins stolen from uh you know malicious uh copies of it um back in the the wild west of of uh, bitcoin um yeah and i don't i don't recall whether sx ended up being part of some somehow related to dark wallet if any of those guys were involved in in sx i seem to recall there may have been some relationship there but i can i can't say that for sure Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. And that concludes our episode for today. <laughs> Thank you, Christo. I, I really appreciate that you come and it was, it was, I think this is the first time we talked. Uh, it was nice, nice to see you here. And yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. It was it was a pleasure to talk to you guys. I'm excited to. Uh, I haven't had a chance to check out your past episodes yet, but I'm going to go through the the archive. And uh, uh, looks like it's a, a really good study group. And just so you know, um, as far as shared coin goes, I'm still working a little bit in this area. Uh, again, one of my side projects that I'm going to finish eventually is doing a more thorough job of fingerprinting these transactions, trying to quantify them. Um, and I'd like to uh, see how some of these um, more modern analysis tools like uh, Boltzmann sh uh, fare against some of these transactions and, and what we can kind of, what we can find out from there. It's, uh, it's, it's very good that you brought up Boltzmann because, um, so I want to ask everyone, uh, should Boltzmann be the next one? 
or do you want again a voting for for the next? Is is Boltzmann fine with everyone? Um. Yep. Yep. Boltzmann is fine, but we're not going to be able to get the authors on, correct? I don't know. We are going to ask. So we'll see. Okay. All right. So, Kristo, uh -huh. yeah, if, if you want to come next week, then it's going to be Boltzmann. It's, uh, it's more fun to, to look through the paper when there is a talk on the end of the week about it than, than alone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very uh, cool. Thank you, guys. Christoph, you 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 want to maybe ask something, or, or or do you do you feel there is something you did not have the chance to to say? Uh, I think I said everything. Um, if you guys have any feedback about uh, my participation. Uh, in, in the in the chat, uh, giving, uh, giving you an overview of the research or anything like that. I'm happy to to hear any feedback that you have about that, or, or things that you'd like to see uh, me research more in in the future. Anything in that area? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Thank you guys. Uh, like, subscribe, and for that three people who got to the end of this video, then congratulations. Now you know more about coin join sudoku than you know before so thank you and have a good day and good night everyone bye bye take care bye thanks, guys. bye thanks Christoph. bye bye